We're going to do something different today. We're going to fill in the handout at the very beginning. So just to throw you off a little bit, I know that may not make some of you comfortable, but, uh, and also if you picked up a written copy of the message, um, it is, I'm doing a little bit different today. So uh, a lot of changes took place. We uh, welcome you to uh, Hilltop and uh, thank you for joining us today as we worship our Lord and uh, fellowship together as we uh, praise him for what he's doing in our lives. Uh, we need to especially be remembering uh, Don and Matt as they are over in the uh, in, in Lebanon right now, Beirut. Uh, they uh, just finished, a little while ago, they finished church services and uh, Don writes and says it was quite moving to hear the stories of these people. Some of them are very openly sharing Jesus as Lord. Others have to do it a little bit more quietly because um, the people that they are, that they're, where they're from, uh, they would be killed if their family knew that they were Christians. And so uh, that's where Don and Matt are. Uh, we need to be praying for them. Don is sending a, an email out. I don't know if he'll do it daily. He, he said, I'll do it whenever I have Wi-Fi. So uh, uh, he had it today, and so we are very thankful for what God is already teaching them and exposing both Matt and Don to. Again, my, my prayer for them is that they may, that Don and Matt may be ministers to those on the team. I think there are nine of them on the team. And, and we're praying that they will be servants of those people on the team as well as the people there in Lebanon and Egypt. Um, there are apparently hundreds of people coming to know the Lord on a regular basis over there right now. Um, one of the things that the, uh, the mission organization does is they, they, um, they deal with those who are... Um, kind of ostracized by by others. Uh, in Egypt, they will be dealing mainly with people who are disabled or handicapped in some way, who uh, nobody wants them. And so when they hear the message that Jesus wants them, they readily respond to it. And so it's, uh, it's amazing what's taking place. And to think that we as a church can have ministries throughout, really throughout the world, uh, from our tiny spot here in Nevada, it is exciting to me to realize that we are able to financially and prayerfully support these individuals who have a heart to uh, go into all the world and share the good news of Jesus. So be much in prayer for them. They're going to be there, uh, to, I think, through the 29th or something like that. Um, but uh, it's exciting to be hearing what's going on over there. Father, we thank you for uh, being able to pray this morning for our brothers who are over uh, in a, uh, uh, in some ways, dangerous territory. We, re we understand that, that uh, standing out for Jesus Christ in that part of the world, uh, it really does uh, reveal the darkness and the evil that is going on uh, throughout our world. And so we thank you that we can pray for Matt and Don as they have this time. Pray for the families too, Hillary and, and Michelle, as uh, they prayerfully support their, their mates. Um, we uh, pray that the good news of Jesus would be would be broadcast, not not necessarily by Don and Matt, but by these these Christ people who are becoming Christians there in in Lebanon and Egypt. And uh, pray that the good news would continue to spread. You often use persecution uh, throughout the Bible to uh, spread the good news of Jesus because people were seeing their need and their need to depend upon you. And so uh, we pray that that's what is taking place there. And we also pray for our country as we think about what's going on here and uh, just uh, the divisiveness and the hatred and the envy and the jealousy and the, the, the uh, horrible, unwholesome words that are being uh, spread uh, by, by a great majority of the people in this country. It's not a political issue. It's a, it's a, a spiritual issue. And so may we understand from this passage exactly what's going on um, in this country, and may we see it as a, one of the greatest opportunities that Christians in this country have ever had. 
when, when sin is so rampant, then we have opportunities to share the solution. When we as a nation think we're a pretty good moral nation and, and have everything together, we don't see our need of you as much. But when you see sin so rampant today, we just realize that uh, it's simply being revealed that people have rejected you and your truth. So may we learn from this passage, continue to learn from this passage, what are the signs and the sins of the times? And we, pray that we thank you that we can pray these things in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, Chris, I just want you to know that I'm going to be talking to you pretty quick, okay? Okay, you ready? You don't need to say anything, honestly. You don't. Uh, I'm going to be God, and you're going to be one of my creation, okay? Yeah. So we're play acting all around here, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's fill out the handout, uh, first of all. Just uh, turn there in the bulletin with me, and we will uh, go through that. And uh, I have the opening question, how does ungodliness show up in everyday life? And then I have a paragraph there, people suppress God's truth and don't honor him as God or give thanks to him. Those are the sins that underlie everything else that follows. These are the sins that underlie the consequences of those sins. So... And then I put in verses 21 through 23, we see willful rebellion in the presence of clear light. It is not a knowledge problem, but a belief and will problem. The rebellion, somebody asked last night, is, is the sin that we're, you know, the results that we're seeing here as a, a result of ignorance? And the answer is clearly no. The, the, the sin that we're seeing as a result of this is a willful rebellion. It is deliberate. And it's not a knowledge problem. It's a belief and will problem. They choose not to believe. They choose to reject God and his truth. And then we go to the first results of rejecting God and his truth. And so there's the paragraph there that needs some filling in also. Without God, all of mankind's efforts and ideas are judged to be empty reasonings. When we talk about reasonings here, it's not something that you wish was happening. It's based on facts. They are taking facts and distorting them. And it ends up empty reasonings. They're taking the facts, but, but not finding God's purpose in them. And so they are all of mankind's efforts without God. All their ideas are judged to be empty reasonings. People recognize, and we saw this last week, people recognize God exists and he's strong, but instead of seeking him and turning to him with honor and gratitude, they exchange the glory of God They exchange the, the glory of God. That's what you write in there. They exchange the glory of God in all his majesty, greatness, power, and deity for mere images with no substance. That is idolatry. This is the first sin. This is the first result, the consequence of rejecting God's truth and 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 not you know not honoring him as god or thanking him and i put the essence of sin is to put self or anything else in the place of god the essence of sin is to put self or anything else in the place of God. It can be thoughts, it can be opinions, it could be governments, it could be someone else, some other human being, it could be animal, it could be anything. But it's just putting something else in the place of God. So I put there human religion. Please understand that. And that's what we're seeing here. Human religion in its various forms is a type of justice for suppressing the revelation God has given of himself in creation, history, conscience, maybe you could even put heart there, scripture, and Jesus. And we'll look at the conclusion later on. So now to those of you who always fear missing out on the handout points, you've got them, all right? 
<laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. I may do this all the time. <laughs> What we're looking at is the case of God versus mankind. God versus, uh, we could say, the creator versus his created. Uh, God, the biblical God versus, um, and I use the term biblical there because it really needs to be shared that when people talk about gods today, there are a lot of gods today. People have made a lot of things and a lot of people gods. Um, but, but we're talking about the, the God that's revealed in the Bible here. This is the case of the biblical God versus humanity. And as we saw last week, God has made some truth about himself known to everybody. Everybody, there's there's nobody that has an excuse. At the very least, everyone knows of God's divine nature and eternal power. Everybody knows that God exists and he's powerful. We have, there's a powerful God. Everybody knows that. They've been given truth from God. However, the Bible says all have suppressed these truths. And all are without excuse. As all stand before God, all of us, everybody, if we stand before him in, in you know, according to these verses here, we, we are all guilty. As we saw last week, we are helpless and ungodly and we are sinners and we are enemies of God. All of us fit in that category as it's described in, in Romans chapter 5. We are helpless. Every person, even though they've, re, even though they've, uh, uh, receive truth about God, they have suppressed it. And because of that, everybody is helpless, ungodly, a sinner by nature, and an enemy of God. And his immediate sentence here while on this earth is, is his wrath. And the way his wrath shows up, at least the way it's showing up in the present form, it, it, it shows up, his wrath shows up in the way that he lets us go our own way. He, he lets us go um, <laughs> however we want to go. When you make the choice to suppress God's truth and not honor him as God and not, and not thank him, just saying thank you and honoring God as God, who, which is who he is. When we don't do that, he, as part of his wrath, his judgment, as part of his sentence, he lets us go our own way. And we see this showing up. Somebody came up afterward and said, well, how does this show up today? Well, it shows up in idolatry. It shows up in dishonored bodies. It shows up in degrading passions. And it shows up in depraved minds. It clearly shows up when a nation or an individual rejects God and his truth, when they don't simply honor him as God or give thanks to him, it shows up in those four things, idolatry, dishonored bodies, depraved, you know, uh, uh, depraved minds and degraded passions. Those four areas, we'll look at the, we'll look at idolatry today, dishonored bodies and degraded passions next week and depraved minds. And I, I mean, again, you could take these verses and put them on the, uh, uh, you know, on the New York Times and write about, just don't make, make sure you don't say it's a biblical reference, but just uh, say this is what, this is what's taking place in our country today. And there would be full agreement that this is what's happening. But what they don't put is the reasons why, the reasons why these things are, are taking place. It's because we have rejected God and his truth that everyone knows. Some of us know more truth than others. But we need to understand that some truth has been given to every individual. And because of that, um, they are without excuse. And so out of love and wrath, by the way, those are not incompatible words biblically. God is a loving God. And God is also a God of wrath. Those are not incompatible. Now, we need to make sure that we're not defining wrath according to the way we see it displayed in, among humanity today, the anger and the hatred and, and, and the, the lashing out and retaliation and revenge. That, that's not what God's wrath is all about. 
There's, there's going to even be a day of wrath the Bible talks about uh, for the non-Christian that's, that's coming down the road. But now he's presently uh, letting people and nations experience the results of their choices. And so you, you say not honoring God as God or thanking him, and you add to that the deliberate suppression of truth. The, these have disastrous consequences. And so in these verses, we see willful rebellion in the presence of clear light. Again, as I said on the handout, it's not a knowledge problem, but a belief and will problem. And this is the key. All of this, all of this is designed to lead us to repentance and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he's using even the disastrous choices of individuals. And so it's a great time to be alive. We think, oh, my land, look at our nation and the choices it's making and the people we put in play power, you know, uh, positions of authority. No, we don't put people in positions of authority. God does. If you want to see the best example of that I know in Scripture, it's, it's uh, Nebuchadnezzar and, Jan and Daniel chapter 4. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar... Um, he gets up one morning, he looks out over his kingdom, and he says, oh, what a great man I am. This is all because of me. And God takes him, and he makes him like an animal of the field, um, eating grass for seven periods of time. Most people think those are years. And finally, one day, after those seven periods of time, he comes to his senses and he realizes, God, you're the one who establishes kings and removes kings. All praise, all honor, all worship belongs to you. And so if that's what's needed in our country, may we pray that our leaders become animals of the field. <laughs> Very honestly, if that... If if that's what's needed, you don't see that happening to everybody in the scripture where God deals with them, but you see it happening there. And if, if that's what it takes, see, God, God is using the worst that humanity can do to show us our need of him. And he will use whatever judgment, whatever wrath, whatever his wrath looks like, he will use that to show our need of a na as a nation and as individuals, our needs of him and his truth. Keep that in mind as we look at these things. Keep in mind that the, these are results. And so it, it, start with, we'll start with verse 18 of Romans chapter 1. I've practically given you my whole message already. So, uh, for the, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. That simply means injustice. It's a legal term. Unrighteousness means, righteousness means justice. It's a legal term. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The word suppress means to, it's like we take God's truth that he's revealed about himself, we put it in a little box, we, we close the lid on the box, and we sit on it. We just, we want nothing to do with it. We, we suppress it. And he goes on and says here, verse 19, because that which is known about God. Why is God's wrath poured out upon her and God less and unrighteousness? Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. Over in Romans chapter 2, uh, verses 15, it's so interesting. He's not talking to, to the Israelites there who had been given the written law. He's talking to those who don't have the law. But he says in verse 15 of chapter 2, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. So people understand some truth about God simply because he's written his words on their hearts. 
because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident, clear to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So you have both outward and inward evidences that, that, that are truth about God, some facts about God. And so everybody has those, those two things. And then it goes on and says in verse 21, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. And that first phrase there in verse 21, for even though they knew God. Although all are acquainted with God's existence. I'd like to... uh, and I realize be, this will be a hard stretch for all of us. It is for me, too. Imagine that I'm God. Okay? So that takes quite an imagination. But uh, I'm God. And, Chris, you're my creation. So, hi, Chris. I already know your name. I created you. But I'm I'm God. And I want you to know a couple of things. You are my creation, and I love you. And it's an unconditional love that will never stop. I have given evidence that I exist and that I'm powerful by nature around. Just look at creation. Look at the intricacy of a a human hand. Look at the body, the way we're created. Look under a microscope. Look at the, the planetary system and all the world around us. And I created all that. I simply spoke those things into being. I'm God. And I spoke you into being. I created you. I was at work creating you when you were in your mother's womb. And I I deeply care about you. I've even written my law, my words on your heart. And and because I have revealed some truth about, about myself to you, it's because I want you to know me. I want us to have a relationship and fellowship together. I created you for that purpose. And, and so I, I deserve, because I'm God and what I've done, I deserve honor and thanks and, um, you know, response of obedience and faith to the word that I've written on your heart. If that's all you have, just the word written on your heart and the creation around, I, I just want you to know that I really care about you and I pray that you will respond to these truths. Will you? You will, okay? Most people don't, but thank you. But I want you to know something. Uh, you're the first person that's ever said that to me. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I just want you to know that regardless of the choice you make, even if you, were, even if you reject me and don't honor me or give me thanks, I will still love you, and I will continue. I'll, I'll, I'll hunt you down. I'll pursue you. I'll do whatever is necessary to get you to see your need of me. And I pray. Just know that I'll be, I'll be thinking about you and working on your behalf so that you will come to know me as the God I am. Yeah, I know. Isn't that cool? It's so cool. I, and I'm not God saying that. I just think, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's just so cool. But that's the attitude. You know, I could go to every one of you here this morning, and we could go out into all of our community today and share that same message with those people, that God loves you. You are his creation, and he cares about you, and he wants the, he wants the best for you, and the best for us is to know his will, to know his truth, and respond to that with honor and worship and belief and thanksgiving and, and, and obedience. It just makes sense. If, that, if all those things are true, and they are, it's truth about God, 
that's the, way, that's the message we get to share with these people who are ruining their lives by their choices of suppressing God's truth and rejecting who he is and, and what he's done. And I pray we get that. I pray you get that. And then I pray that we share that with others because the only solution for this country right now and for the people who are, it's so obvious what's taking place, the dishonored bodies and the, you know, the, the degrading passions and the, the, the depraved thinking, the depraved minds. The only solution is Jesus. There aren't two solutions. You know, people today talk about, you know, the, uh, um, uh, well, everybody, there, there are a lot of different ways to God. They're just finding their own way to God. The things that are taking place are, today are, are not nations or individuals seeking God. It's, they are signs of, of people who are rejecting God. Please get that. And, and understand that these, these the, you know, the cults and the, the, the false religions, they are not another way to God. There's only one way to God, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray we get that. So thank you, Chris. Thank you for your good response. Blessed are you. You're part of my family. <laughs> oh, that's very uncomfortable for me to do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to stress the point that God is speaking to us now we're, that we're in some ways further down the road, but it was true even during that time, but from creation and from these, the, God's words on our hearts and, and, the, you know, and from history, you look back, especially as you look at the history of, of, of Israel, uh, you have truths in the Bible. You have Jesus, but from all those things, our hearts and creation and history and the Bible and Jesus, we know there's a God. We do. We know something about him. If we've looked at all those different things, we know more than just he's a powerful God. But at the very least, they know, people know, that there's this powerful God that exists, and that is enough that if that person will follow up on that truth, if they will seek God, then he will lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Sometimes he does that through missionaries. Sometimes he just does it like, you know, he, he might take somebody like Philip and transplant him to meet a guy going down, a, you know, going away from Jerusalem who's hungry for truth. God can, God God takes the responsibility. If we act upon what we know, uh, he will continue giving us further truth. We can trust God to do that. He deserves our, uh, our belief and obedience. He, he deserves, our, uh, you know, he deserves our, our praise and thanks. Why can't a person just say, thank you, God? Thank you. I recognize you're God and I'm not. Why can't we just honor him? You know, it's, it's amazing to me. We have to teach people, you know, say thank you. Say th it seems like that would just be, man, alive. There's this powerful God who exists. Thank you that I'm alive and thank you for giving me breath and thank you for, you know, all the things that you do. My land, you're, you're quite a God and yet you care about me? Enough to reveal truth about yourself to me? It just makes sense when you think about, can you just say thank you? Can you just, just honor me as for who I am? But people don't do these two things. And so I looked at the last part of verse 21 and I, I, I kind of came up with a, a rephrase, I call them rephrases, where you go back and you try and say what the passage is saying, only doing it in maybe a little bit different words. Uh, sometimes you get that from another uh, translation. Uh, uh, you know, as you look at the Bible, sometimes you get it from a paraphrase. Sometimes you just do it yourself. But I, I put for the last part of verse 21, they, they don't praise him, which means to have a good opinion of him. <laughs> This is the biblical God who has revealed truth about himself. They don't have a good opinion of God. 
they also don't give thanks to him. Instead, all their reasonings end in futility or emptiness, and their lack of understanding hearts are deprived of light. Notice here, this is a result. These are results. You, you see all their reasonings. They're, they're, they take all the facts and they put them in place and it, they end up empty. It's futile. And their hearts, uh, the, their lack of understanding hearts, they don't respond to the word that's written on their hearts. Well, they respond, but they, they reject it. And it says their lack of understanding hearts are deprived of light. The light switch is turned off. That's the reason people are going around in darkness today. This is a result. So removing God and his truth from your consideration results in empty reasoning or, or, or thoughts. That because they rejected God, there's no light in their lives. At, at the core of their being, this is what it's saying, at the core of their being, they are empty and dark. And instead of honoring or thanking God, they substitute their own ideas and they end up not able to make sound judgments. Everyone ends up with their own ideas of who and what God is and what is right or wrong. And if we don't have a better description, I, I don't think there's a better description in all of our society today than that. Everyone ends up with their own ideas of who and what God is and what is right or wrong. And so you don't have a uniting here around ultimate truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. You have everybody trying to convince everybody uh, of, their, of the rightness of their own causes. And if they don't agree, they hate you and set out to destroy you. In verses 22 and 23, asserting or affirming or claiming themselves to be wise, cultivated, they become fools, but that doesn't mean stupid. It's, it's more the idea of rebellious. That's just what they become. The word, the very fools, is used of tasteless salt. It just means there's no use. There's no value. Behind a facade of wisdom, they become just fools, Phillips paraphrases. Behind a facade of wisdom... They become just fools. In verse 23, and they trade or exchange the essence of the imperishable, immortal, not liable to decay God for a, a likeness resembling perishable, corruptible man and things that fly or run or crawl. They take God, the essence of who God is, all of his glory, his majesty, and they trade him in on this inferior model made by themselves. Without God, we claim the ability to know what needs to be known and to handle everything. And God says, fools. And the fool in Scripture is a person who willfully, not ignorantly, who willfully makes decisions contrary to God's truth. And so instead of the will of God, instead of seeking that, they know truth about God, but they don't want that. They're sitting on that. But they make themselves and their ideas and their, their opinions the standard of life or what is right. Now notice here, they don't, cease to be, they don't cease to be religious. They just make other gods for themselves. And God's glory, the word, the word in the Old Testament means, means weight or value or worth. God's glory, the essence of who he is. You know, you think of a, sometimes you think of a king and all his glory. It's kind of like Nebuchadnezzar thought, wow, look at what I have, look at this. Oh, my kingdom, all, all that I am, I'm responsible for this. Uh, uh, that's the idea of the word glory. But God's glory. His weight, his value, his worth, the essence of who he is. That's what they're trading in here. And they create this inferior model and they worship it. They end up worshiping themselves. 
or their creation. Again, these are not actions seeking God. They are actions of people rejecting God. And if God doesn't have the place of preeminence that is rightfully his, then humans will put something or someone else in his place. People do this because they've suppressed God's truth and didn't honor him or give thanks. And we'll see what that looks like in society in our next two studies. So on your handout, if you want to follow along there, I've got some, you might as well follow along with me on that because it's, uh, I've got three paragraphs there. I think my last study, I practically fill up a whole page of notes just with my, just with my notes. I might as well teach from that um, in a couple of weeks. But notice here, God gave truth to mankind. It's so clear. And mankind's actions prove we rejected it. Some of the evidence of suppressing the truth, mankind has rejected the truth within and the evidences of creation without. People without Jesus neither honored God as God nor thanked him. They have traded him in for an image, an inferior model. What is the verdict against every person who rejects God and his truth? Guilty. What's the sentence? The wrath of God, which shows up in people becoming futile in their speculations, their foolish hearts becoming darkened, becoming fools, and remaining religious but without the biblical God. Humanity's only hope. And I pray that we as Christians realize that it's not who's in office. We sometimes think if just this person was in office or we could get this party in office or whatever we think the solution is those are not the solutions humanity's only hope is God's salvation his righteousness or justice second paragraph God's good news is also revealed to us as we saw that in in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1 his righteousness has been revealed to us it is only when people are convicted of their sins toward God suppressing his truth not honoring him as God not thanking him trading him in on an inferior image that they'll be ready to repent of those sins and believe the good news message and turn to Jesus this is the great privilege of us of the church of Christians. It's your task and mine to spread this message that, and this is a quote from a hymn, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Love. We spread this good news by our own witnessing, by supporting church planters and new churches, and by sending out and encouraging missionaries. The alternatives are clear. It's either God's righteousness or God's wrath. There are no other choices. So the question for each of us today, will you live by faith in what God has revealed and done, or will you do the opposite, suppress his truth and not honor and thank him? And in many ways, this is the most important question you will ever answer on this earth. What will you do with God and his truth that's been revealed. What will you do with Jesus? Your answer determines your eternal destiny. You're you're either going to be forever with God or separated from him. It's your choice.